Hello. How is everyone doing? Who's still billing by the hour? All of you? Is that why you're here? All right. That's okay. We'll change it. I'm Stephanie. I lead the team at Lawyerist, and I'm on a personal mission to kill the billable hour because I felt like every point two sucked a little bit of my soul away. This is a really sensitive. They're very sensitive. My name is Matthew Kerbis. I'm also on a mission to kill the billable hour. Uh, I feel like this is really a support group for me and Stephanie. So thank you for joining us today. Thanks for being here. I think we win at Tech Show for longest title of, uh, of a session. It was hard to figure out exactly how to say this. We have a lot to cover today. Please download the materials from the app. We will not get to every slide. It's mostly just for you to have resources so that you could do some follow-up on your own and do that uh, due diligence and research that lawyers are good at. So, you know, you read the slides, you know, this is what we're, we're gonna do today, how AI tools are improving efficiency in legal work, including research, contract analysis, document drafting, and more. I mean, I'll just go through it. How leveraging AI impacts different law firm billing models, and we're gonna uh, discuss and debate those today, including potential drops in profitability from hourly billing versus subscription and value-based pricing. We'll discuss new business models, and pricing strategies firms can adopt to increase profitability when incorporating AI tools into workflows. We know this is of interest because Altfee won the startup pitch competition. So we know there's a lot of interest in this. But before we dive in, I just want to highlight an example, a hypothetical for you. Let's say that you charge $500 an hour. 10 hours of billable time makes you $5,000. Let's say that Gen AI can make 10 hours of billable time take only 10 minutes of work. I mean, it really, when we put this together was several months ago now, it's probably less than 10 minutes of work, but for purposes of the hypothetical, let's say it's 10 minutes so we could look at the numbers. Under the billable hour, you get $5,000 worth of work, but with Gen AI, it's only 100. What do you do? Do you raise your rates? Well, let's see what that looks like. To make 0.2 of an hour worth $5,000 means you would have to bill $25,000 an hour. I don't think Jane is going to let us get away with that ethically. <laughs> yeah. Safe bet. Right. Very, very unreasonable. A 5,000% increase, right? I don't think your clients are going to want to pay that. Right, we already we discovered this, right? Probably not ethical. So what does that mean for serving the latent legal market and access to justice? That's just gonna widen the gap if we if this is how we, we make up that difference. What are your options? That's what we're here to talk about today. So, Stephanie. Yeah. I mean, the hypothetical's good because even if you take I out of it for a second. When you're billing by the hour and you want to make more money, there's only two ways to do it, right? Raise your rates or bill more hours. But guys, no one is paying you for the time it takes you to do anything. What I want, I'm paying for, I'm paying for the hole in the wall. What I'm really paying for is the picture to get hung. Really, Kelsey's wife's going to come hang my picture. My neighbor's here. I came to Chicago to see my neighbor and his wife has this great side business where she does home improvements because... We all know we're not doing it. So I don't care how long it takes her to do the hole. And I actually, you know, and hang the picture. And I don't care how much the screwdriver or a hammer costs. I want the problem solved. As lawyers, we're solving problems. So why are we charging people and pricing our business based on how long things take us? When, especially in today's world, I mean, if AI doesn't bring this home for us, we've been preaching this story around tech for years. But now I think it's really come so visible because of the drastic reduction in time these tasks are gonna take. It has been more profitable to not bill your time for a long time. Gen AI has just made that more obvious and frankly, more profitable. And that doesn't mean you have to charge a lot of money. I don't. I charge $20 a month and $50 a page for clients to get started. And for some clients, that's all they need. And sure, I have ways that I can sell subscription add-ons or other flat fee services, or if they're really taking advantage of the $20 a month and $50 a page pricing, and they start sending a lot of pages, that I could bundle that in a higher level package subscription where we start counting pages and they get more value for getting the work done where we're no longer counting pages. Because at the end of the day, I don't love counting pages because it's still a like, counting metric, right? It's not necessarily value-based pricing, right? 
It's just my attempt to try to make pricing more accessible and understandable and predictable for myself and my clients. And it's not perfect. And not everything about subscription-based billing, which, you know, that's what I like to talk about, the subscription model plus AI. It's not your only option for our alternative model, but you give me a flat fee model and I'll try to help figure out a way to also add subscription to solve the underscoping, underscoping problem. But $50 a page scales incredibly well. Somebody is going to an event space and they want them to sign a waiver and it's a one page waiver and my client can take a picture of that and send it over to me and for $50 I'll be able to advise them whether or not they should or shouldn't sign it or what changes they should make to make it uh, signable or whether or not it's even enforceable if there's any consideration depending on the circumstances that they've already paid all that kind of stuff, right? And for them, that's a no-brainer, and I only make $50, 70 if you include that month, they pay their $20. But then what happens when they are leaving a job, they get a separation agreement, or they're just accepting a new job and there's an employment contract, and we're talking about 15 to 20 pages sometimes. It's good money. It's good money for me. It's, something my, it, it's a big enough circumstance in a client's life that they're going to want legal advice for that, and it's an exact number that they can understand. And you know what I do if I'm super busy? I throw that tool through Paxton, which is a tool I've been using for a while, or use your generative AI tool of choice, and you could get results quick, so you could get at least something back to your client if they did wait to get to you before they had more time to, to talk about it with their employer or their situation. But when they're already paying you every month, they're going to reach out to you earlier. Yeah. Yeah, so the first model we're going to talk about today, obviously, is the subscription model. The good news is your clients are already primed to interact with you this way. I mean, probably everybody has, most people now have a subscription for some kind of streaming service, yes? Right, I mean, even we used, the way we used to buy software, right? Remember the days when you purchased Office and they sent you a CD or floppy disk or something and that's how you, and that's what you owned. But now I don't think that's an option anymore. You just have to sign up for the monthly fee and then you have a subscription. There's now subscriptions for car services. You can subscribe to a Porsche if you want to drive a different kind of Porsche around. Eyeglasses, there's subscriptions for eye care. There's subscriptions for, I mean, there's probably well, so well, many. Well, to give I mean, the, like the car food. example is a great one. And Hyundai does a version of a car subscription. Hyundai does not sponsor this presentation today. But it's a good example of think about what you could do in your law firm for all of the services that you provide, all the value you can give to your clients. And sometimes the value is that it's a predictable, affordable price, although that's not really goes to the heart of value-based billing. Sometimes it's just knowing that I talked to an attorney and I have a better understanding of the legal context in this situation for a reasonable price. But think about all the different things if you unbundle all of your benefits that you could give your clients, all the value you could give them. And how do you bundle that back in? So the Hyundai example is, think about everything that goes around with owning a car. Well, there's car insurance as part of that, right? And so part of Hyundai's subscription, which is a true month-to-month -month subscription, is they bundle car insurance. So they bring all that experience of all the extra things. Well, I get a car, I have to do registration, I have to get car insurance, I have to do this, I have to do that. Well, they bundle it all into one subscription package. And sure, you might end up paying a little bit more than you would if you just bought a Hyundai or at least a Hyundai. But you're getting all that value, that extra value and that time savings, that's kind of worth it. So we could take that example and we could extrapolate it to our law practice and we could think about how we can do that with the services that we can provide our clients. So, you know, we'll, we, you know, we'll get through these, these slides. I feel like we're already off we're script. We're just gonna, yeah, we're just, there's slides and we're gonna talk. <laughs> we're gonna, you know, Stephanie, do you wanna talk about uh, value-based billing? Yeah, so the another, besides subscription, I mean, there's kind of three categories though, really we're talking about, right? There's subscriptions, there's flat fees, and then there's another concept of value-based billing, which also can really touches on all these things, right? There, it, there, it's just, how are you approaching how you charge for what you do? How do you charge someone for the problems you solve? And so with value, traditionally when we talked about value-based pricing, the idea is that you're giving almost a custom price for the work that you're doing. And so here's an example to kind of tell you what I mean. In, in value-based pricing, it starts with a conversation with your clients. So number one, we have to start getting comfortable talking about money. I know you think you talk about money, but you don't. 
Most of you are like, you tell the, the very end of the, you have this conversation with your client. Well, I'm going to charge you whatever the, I don't know what going rates are. $350 an hour. I need a $10,000 retainer and you'll get a bill every month. No, no, most clients don't equate that. They don't really understand what they, th that you just said. They probably heard $10,000. They probably think that means the, co the cost of the case is going to be $10,000. And then now what do you have? You have an AR problem because when they get that next bill, when, you, when you're when you over the retainer and now it's $12,000, they're like, wait, what? what is this bill? Now they can't pay you. Now you're in the case. You can't get out. The judge wants you in that case. And, and now you have an AR problem. So I'm telling you the best way to solve your AR problems is it starts at the very beginning with you getting comfortable talking about money and letting clients know, are they buying a Hyundai or are they buying a Porsche? Because most clients have no idea when they walk out of your that initial consult with you what they just signed up for. So we have to start getting really good and comfortable in practice talking about money. So with value-based billing, we're gonna start asking clients what matters to them. Does speed matter to them? Does access to you matter to them? I have some clients who like, if you're on their highest level of service, you can call them same day and always get a call. But if you're on another level of service, you might get a call back within 24 or 48 hours. So an example of a value-based billing is you say, okay, you need a contract. I have three options for you. Option one is you can purchase my template and fill it out yourself. Let's just say that's a thousand, I don't know, I'm gonna make up random numbers today, a thousand dollars. Option number two is our associate will draft a bespoke contract for you and you'll have it in 30 days and that's gonna be $3,500. Option three is that same person will draft it for you. You'll have it by close of business tomorrow. It's $6,000. Now the client can choose. I'd like that. And, and interesting enough, like might choose the $6,000 option. And that's weird to us because we're like, wait, but we're used to billing by the hour and it took five hours to build that contract, you know, to create that contract. And so, you know, how many of you, I'll raise my hand for this one. I have literally spent Christmas Eve writing a TRO brief and away from my family. I didn't get any extra pay for that because I built at the time I was billing by the hour. So my client paid me the exact same as if I did that work on February 3rd. But I had to do it on Christmas Eve because it was really important and urgent and they needed it and there was something happening. You know, that's why you filed TROs. And you made no extra money because you're just billing by the hour. Right. And so uh, it's a really important example when we're thinking about alternative business models for law firms because what does that do? That actually creates the inverse relationship between time and money. The less time I spend on this and the quicker it gets turned around to the client, the more money I make if you give them this good, better, best pricing option. So how do we get the results faster? I mean, you just need to go to the, the, the vendors <laughs> that are all offering some sort of analysis or drafting or redlining or, or research type AI tools and, and all the solutions are on the show floor. And I've demoed all of them and I'm still alpha and beta testing some that aren't even at Tech Show yet, but I expect they'll be at Startup Alley in a year or two. So these tools are only gonna get better, right? They're the worst they're ever gonna be. And so it's only a matter of time before attorneys who listen to what Stephanie and I are talking about are doing what we're suggesting and they're not billing by the hour. And this could be you in this room that you go out there and you outcompete all the other lawyers who are still billing by the hour because you take this inverse relationship approach with time and money. The less time you spend on something, the more valuable it can be for your clients and the more money you could, you could arguably charge them if, they're, if they find that value. That's just, this is where the value-based pricing comes in. Or, you know, you may have spent a long time building out your, you know, I'm, I'm drinking out of my carrot mug up here. You know, maybe you have a hot doc set where you've spent a lot of time customizing your estate planning documents and you built it out and, you know, you got the smart people like Baron to code it for you so you can enter the magic and, and, and it's your customized document. If you're billing by the hour and it only takes 10 minutes to put the inputs in per client, you're not really getting the value of the work product that you created because a lot of that went in front loaded. Maybe you front loaded that time and effort by creating the customized documents and creating that work product. So it wouldn't make any sense to now, you know, continue to build that by the hour based on the amount of time you're putting in over here. Does that make sense? But a lot of times when we're, when we're not thinking globally about our work product, or really just our value. I think that we have to start disassociating like 
couples our value with with the end results because sometimes the value someone just stopped me after my last talk and was like he's very upset because he's worried that technology means we're not going to be client centered anymore and have personalized touches like what he heard was like technology somehow we're going to automate everything and why would clients even go to lawyers and i was like no like lawyers are the pro like we're going to get rid of the boring work that we hate doing. It's going to free us up for those personal touches. It's going to free us up for the hard stuff, for the for the good conversations. That's what clients actually want us to do. They don't want us bogged down writing documents. They want our brains and real conversations and questions and answer sessions, right? And that's what clients are paying for. They're paying for the access to your brain and your ability to analyze things and answer questions and give them comfort. Just knowing that your clients, just knowing that they can call you, I mean, it never would occur to me to send you a waiver before I, you know, I willingly sign my life away every time we go into whatever park or bouncy house. I'm just like, oh, it's probably not enforceable. I have no idea. I'm like, you know, but to think that I have access to our company, we have an HR law firm that has lawyers in all 50 states. We pay a flat, I think, $250 fee every month. That gives us access to an online portal where we can ask any HR question we want, unlimited. So we go in all the time because, you know, how many times do we have questions about, like, I'm not an employment lawyer. I feel like I know enough employment law to be dangerous. I know enough to, like, I think we need to ask a question now. What it empowered us to do is give our HR department access to lawyers where before we would have been like, well, is this worth calling me a lawyer and getting a $450, you know, hour bill? Now we're like, here's the access HR team. Anytime they have any question, they just pop into that portal and ask and they get a result. And that's a subscription? Yeah. Yeah. So another, going off of Stephanie's earlier example of the good, better, best pricing. And when I say good, better, best pricing, I'm saying that. I don't actually know if that those terms made it into the deck. So make sure you write that down. The subscription economy itself has its, all kind, is its own unique lingo. And that wasn't even an example of good, better, best pricing with subscription-based pricing, though the psychology of it, I think, is very similar. That was just a value-based project-type work, so a one-time flat fee-type work. But then you have to think about for this client, depending on their situation, you know, is you know, access to a template. Well, depending on what they're doing, what industry they're in, are they just an, uh, an everyday person? Are they a small business owner? Access to your templates might be a great subscription benefit that it, maybe that's all they want. They'd rather have a lawyer who has made documents rather than just going to LegalZoom. And LegalZoom only does so much. And so there's ample market opportunity to, to spin up a competitive product to what LegalZoom does in a different space. And depending on the market you're trying to serve, those clients might be willing to pay a monthly amount for access to those forms, just like lawyers does for HR services. So there's so many opportunities that you could look at this one-off transaction and think of, can, is there more value that I could provide to this client on an ongoing basis what, based on what the needs that they have? I, I, go ahead. Well, I was kind of curious. We kind of talked about this could be fun. This could be a disaster. We'll see. I'm curious right now if anyone's like has an idea for a subscription or has a practice area that you think that will, I hear what you guys are saying, but that will never work for me. Cause we thought it could be fun to challenge us. Cause we're pretty sure we can turn any practice into any of these things. Yeah. So we'll see how this works. Perfect. Let's, so let's repeat it. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, so the question is, I hear you, Stephanie, but if I give someone that whatever, you know, they're going to bug the you know what out of me they're going to constantly call me they're going to overuse the service they're going to book every appointment possible because now they have all this access right and so let's go to the part let's go to the slides where we talk about uh, some of the technology features here so i'll tell you while i'm, while I'm trying to find these uh, these tools that you're going to want to use here's what i'm going to say about that so i've been even though i've been researching and talking to people and writing about and interviewing for my podcast for for you know, three to four years on this topic. I've only had my law firm, Subscription Attorney LLC, for two years about. I'm even one, one month sh uh, shorter than two years. And so I charge $20 a month and $50 a page. And I've never had a client schedule a bunch of calls in a row. And, and that's an important thing I want to say. Schedule a bunch of calls in a row. Here we go. Scheduling tech, right? So what do you want to do with scheduling tech? And this is true even if you don't want to switch from billing time. 
control your calendar instead of it controlling you. Put everything in your calendar, right? Automate scheduling of various kinds of calls and meetings. And it's not sexy AI, but it's automation. So everything, right? Intake, consultations, attorneys, team members, and more. You could do all of this using tools that I'll show you on the next slide. And what, you, what else you could do is you could automate buffer times, right? Yeah, no, I mean, these are very specific. I was gonna go high level first. Okay, go ahead. No, two things, number one, your clients are just as busy as you. They don't have time to bug you. They're running their lives and building their businesses. They're busy, they don't have time. Mm -hmm. They're just as busy as you. So number one, I think your fear, I hear your fear, but it just doesn't come, it normally just doesn't happen. I'm a business coach to lawyers. When you sign up for one of my programs, you get unlimited access to our business coaches. I mean, theoretically, we're gonna have a scheduled call with you every week. But honestly, if you need if you need us, like we're gonna get on a call with you. I've, I've, every one of my labsters has a link to my calendar. They may not, if they, I mean, they do if they went and found it. Um, but even when I was more prominent with it, nobody overuses it. If they do, guess what? They may not be a good fit for the program, and I can just fire them. Or I can say, you know, for the level of service you want, you actually need to be, you, we need to charge you more. This isn't working out. Like, if you're just dipping your toe in this, test it out. Don't sign up people for year-long contracts. Sign up for a quarter and see how it goes because you need to get your pricing right too. So you got to give yourself room to experiment and you'll find the sweet spot. But most people don't abuse it and you'll be fine. This, that's what I love about the power of, we will get to your question very next. This is what I love about the power of month to month subscriptions. And I realize with litigation, that's a heck of a lot harder, but I think I just wanna highlight that just for this scenario. If it's a month to month subscription and you're not in litigation where if they stop paying, you have to file a motion to withdraw, then, then you can drop your client if they abuse it. I've never had to do that in two years for the, you know, I, I haven't quite crossed the 50 client threshold yet. So it's possible that I'll hit a certain level or I get the wrong client where, where they're gonna abuse it. But if, especially if they're a small business owner, they're trying to make money in their business. If they're doing whatever they're doing, they wanna spend time with their family. Like the whole reason they're hiring you, especially on a subscription basis, is because like they just wanna offload their legal stuff to you and get back to everything else. They have better things to do than, than, than talk to their lawyers, but I think it's important to just highlight the technology and the reasoning that you should be doing these things, right? Calendly is what I use, right? HubSpot is another great tool. Acuity, which was acquired and integrated into uh, Squarespace, if you're using that for your website. Google Appointments is Google's version of this, and Microsoft Bookings is their version, right? So here's the technology for how you do it. And this is what I do. I don't, the subscription benefit is not they could call you whenever they want. It is they get access to a scheduling link to schedule set limits of, uh, of calls with you. So I only allow 15 minute calls to be scheduled with me for introductory calls if they want to hire me or for clients. And the way that I define my subscription benefits, getting into Stephanie's example, maybe you have to charge her more, $20 a month gets you the end of my day. That's when you could schedule your 15 minute calls with me. And you get access to most of, but not all of, but most of my flat fee a la carte services. If you want to pay me $100 a month, or if you're one of my small business or freelancer subscribers, you get access to my whole calendar of availability for that day to schedule only 15 minute calls. I'm in control of my business and my law firm and how much time I want to give my clients to talk to me. So they know when they schedule their call that one of their subscription benefits is 15 minutes. That's the amount of time that they get to talk to you. And then they could schedule another call. And going back to the previous slide, I don't let clients schedule calls with me within 24 hours. Now I'm sure there's a subscription plusing package that you could offer or a, or a one-time emergency flat fee. There are ways that you could automate this. We're like, well, I need a call right now. I need to schedule a call, but there's nothing in 24 hours. I'm sure there's a way that you could automate and put a button on it. Well, I need a call now and I'll pay an extra hundred bucks to do it. If it's really genuinely an emergency, right? So put a number there that they might be willing to pay. And, and, and that's the way that I get around it. And if I need more time with a client, they signed up for a simple estate plan. We're negotiating an MSA. We need to discuss red lines. Well, first of all, I'm just going to use Descript and I'm going to record a quick thing and send a link over to them. I use Descript like some people use Loom. And then maybe we'll be able to get it done in a 15 minute call. So you handle things asynchronously when you can. And by the way, Descript is an AI tool. So that's another way AI is going to help and speed things up. But if you need 30 minutes or 45 minutes, well, I have those links too. And I really leverage Calendly's one click use links so they can't abuse that link if I want to give them 30 minutes or an hour because we're going to need that 30 minutes or an hour. 
So leveraging these tech tools is super important to keep them within the constraints of the concerns that you had. We did have another question, but if you want to finish this point. Uh, I don't remember what I was going to say, so. Okay. Elizabeth? Up front. So yeah, it's a fantastic question. And so the, like with anything, maybe litigation, this applies to, there's a lot of work up front, right? Complaint or responsive pleading, preparing discovery, right? Like right in the beginning, there's tons of work. And then it sort of depends on the orders that you get from the court. I mean, I, I know less about immigration. I've had now three attorneys on my podcast that do some version of flat fee or, or subscription pricing uh, that, that are in immigration. So I'm learning a little bit more about it. It's harder for me to talk specific to that, but... I think the solution is not just subscription, right? And so the, it's subscription and flat fee. And there are different ways that you could do this. So there, there are slides for this, subscription and flat fee, right? But you, you charge, go ahead, because I could, I'll not forget where I'm leaving off. If you want to. Oh, just, just that. Like it doesn't, it may not, well, you can go with what you okay. So, so, yes. So, so here, here's, here's what I recommend. And, and with, um, with immigration, though, I know like a lot of it depends on the government and all these things are out of your control. So this might not apply as much for immigration as it does for litigation. Uh, but oftentimes in litigation, getting to an end result faster is something that's valuable for your client. So what I have been recommending and what I've seen done in certain circumstances are there's an initial flat fee up front that's a higher amount than a monthly ongoing subscription fee as the case progresses. And you have to think about, I mean, and you, you have to look at data. If you do immigration and you only do H-1B visas, then you know how, how you, you know the average amount of money you're making on these cases, right? You have to look back and see what you're charging. If you're already charging flat fee, you know exactly what you're making, right? So you could look at that number. And, and I take the latent legal market approach. First of all, I do it because I, I, ca I genuinely care about serving the legal needs of people that have long just not been able to hire an attorney. But there's also a huge market opportunity there, right? You have to consider that. Um, but you can use what I'm talking about and just do premium pricing. So you could even find ways, if you're so inclined, to say, like, I make an average of wh whatever, $6,000 per immigrate, per whatever the thing you do for immigration. But I know if I charge, I, I, you could set up a flat fee plus subscription pricing where you end up making $7,000 um, because there might be some things that take longer or some issues that happen like what's your mo like what's your most expensive case where you felt like maybe you lost money there's ways to to make up the difference but my point is is you maybe charge a thousand dollars a month depending on the type of case for high volume cases I once helped somebody come up with this a thousand dollars a month or a thousand dollars to get started 250 a month for an average of a one and a half to two year case but there was a but something that I didn't have at the time, but thanks to one of my podcast guests, Mark Stiving, who's not even a lawyer, he's just a pricing expert. He said, create like a pot of money that you get access to if you resolve the case sooner, if that's what matters to your client. So like if you're able to mediate the case before then, well, maybe there's a $5,000 success fee to mediate the case to completion within six months. And then after six months to a year, it becomes $4,000. And then after from a year to a year and a half, it becomes $3,000, right? So there's a decreasing pot but it incentivizes you to get the case done sooner because that's what's valuable for your client. And, and you're making this monthly amount throughout the case. Now, at the end of the day, a lot of it in litigation is outside of your control, emergency motions, things come up, you discover new facts, there's new evidence, it, things are gonna take longer, more depositions, but that's what that monthly fee is for. Well, it took longer, there's more work. Well, you know, there's another briefing schedule, that's 60 more days that we didn't anticipate. Well, you're getting paid that X amount a month. And so that covers it. And you stop, you, you stop thinking about time versus money and you know, depositions have time constraints, so you just have to budget. Let's just assume when I do this case, every deposition lasts the full amount. And some depositions will go the full amount and some won't go the full amount. So, I mean, it takes a long time to figure out what the exact numbers are going to be, but there's definitely a way to, to price flat fee plus subscription going into litigation style cases with a, this success fee at the end, depending on how you resolve the case. And I've also seen firms experiment with different phases of litigation be in a different monthly amount. So, you know, we're at the pleading phase and that's phase one and it's gonna be, I'm just, again, making up numbers, $1,000 a month. But then when we get to discovery, it's gonna be a different amount per month because, and and I think most of us know if we actually were to, I mean, even if you just go with your gut, if I said to you, you know, what's this? It's a it's a divorce case and it's, medium contested and this is these are going to be the issues most of you if you thought about it would be like yeah that's a 30 to forty thousand dollar case 
Well, you can then reverse engineer it and think about well, what, what are the phases? What's a typical time? Like you can build this out. I think, I mean, I think all the things we're saying, it can be done. It's just harder. Let's just be honest. Doing hours times 0.2 in a rate is easy. There's no risk on our side and it's just really simple. And all the things we're talking about, we're getting into pricing strategy and, you know, and there's risk and there's information and there's data and it's just hard. And so I think that's part of our hesitancy is like, it can be more profitable for your business for sure. And there's no question that that's the case, but it's going to take a little bit of work on our end to get there and sometimes some creativity. And so with like things like family law and immigration, which I hear a lot of like, well, I can't do it because it doesn't make sense or I'm just charging flat fee. Because I know in certain jurisdictions, it's really easy to do this segmented pricing for family law cases because they require certain certain steps. There's There are things that happen post-resolution of the case that they might need to talk to a lawyer about, right? Compliance things. I mean, this is true of criminal law too if you're on probation, right? So like there there's a way that you can say, well, hey, you know, for I, I know an attorney in the in Australia who is an estate planning attorney, and he, I think he has three different levels, but I, I was I, I can't remember exactly what they are. It's my next podcast episode, so tune in to Law Subscribe. But he charges ninety nine dollars a year as his base package for just an annual check in. So he does the estate planning work for his client. It's a flat fee, and if they want to, they get an annual check in a year from then for ninety nine dollars. And it's just an annual subscription. So you don't have to do month to month. And it depends on the practice area. But now imagine if you did a version of that for your immigra immigration client. Okay, we, we, we reached the resolution. We're a year later. You pay me the $99. Let's have a chat. Let's see what's going on. And, and maybe part of that subscription benefit, and that maybe just the $99 is the annual check-in. But maybe if they wanted to pay $200, now they could schedule a 15-minute call with you a few times throughout the year or something like that. And I don't like to set limitations on that because then I have to track that. So that's why I just do unlimited scheduled calls. Like the less I have to track, the better. That's the whole point of moving away from the billable hour. Let's stop tracking things. But there are ways to do it simple. So, so yeah, and that's one of the ways I'd say for pricing. How do you price it? Keep it simple. All right, there are a lot of questions. So I know. We we'll, have lots of questions. Yeah. All right, hang on. We'll go here, and then we'll start moving around the room, and we'll be quick. So the question is, the courts want to know about, uh, if you're asking for a petition for fees or something like that, like how many hours you spent. So, th so that's a concern. And then also internal KPIs and, and do you have to, so that was question two. Question three was, if you do do an alternative model, are you, are you still going to be tracking your time? I'm going to answer the last question first, and I'm going to say absolutely not. Don't, you have to stop tracking your time because that's valuable time that could be spent building an automation, getting clients, interfacing with the AI and other automation tools to get the client work done. And so I would say don't because that's time better spent doing valuable work for clients or for your firm. For the KPIs thing, it's a sunk cost, let it go. Don't engage in sunk cost logical fallacy, right? This is why some of these large institutions like insurance companies are not going to, and I tried, want their law firms, their panel firms to stop the billable hour and use alternative fees. They have whole departments and SOPs committed to like knocking down billable fees for lawyers. Like what are they gonna do with all that human capital? They're gonna save a ton of money if they let their law, for, if they had come up with predictable flat fee plus subscription based pricing for the panel firms, especially for high volume. For high volume type litigation cases, there's incredible ways to incentivize like the panel firms that get the cases, like within 50 cases, it's X amount a month. If you give us between 51 and 100 cases, it's X, it's, it's you know, 5% less of that amount. Like there's incredible things you could do with subscription and high volume based cases, but these big giant companies that have these high volume things, they're, they're just not willing to do it because they have the sunk costs of, I, we have all these procedures, we have KPIs, we have these things. So you're gonna just need to sort of get over that. that I, I wish I, I mean, Stephanie's the coach, so she's gonna have maybe a better answer for that. And, and for the first one, yeah, I mean, it's hard, right? And, and there's, there's ethical updates that need to be made. When the Illinois Supreme Court changed Rule 1.5 to allow for fixed fees to go like right into operating accounts, I mean, that was huge. And they also have some other new updated language for alternative fee structures for Illinois mm -hmm. that are absolutely incredible. And I thought about writing in and my, my, to, to voice my support and say what I did. But also sometimes when you speak up like that, it's like, well, now they're going to go down this whole other rabbit hole. So it's complicated on how you're going to address this from like an advocacy standpoint and changing the rules in your jurisdiction. But I would look more closely at the rules. And as I have started to help more, like I, I'm a practicing attorney first. Maybe Stephanie is more familiar with this. But as I've started to help some attorneys do this in different jurisdictions, the first thing we do is we look at the ethical rules and figure out, is there a way within these ethical rules that it makes sense to do subscription pricing or flat fee pricing? Because really a subscription is a recurring flat fee. 
Right. So, so that, so, you know, there might be some, you, you know, look, take another look at your, your ethics and see if there's a way that, so that when you go to the judge for that fee petition, you can say, well, according to rule this, comment this, you know, I could charge a, a flat fee and here's how and here's why. Yeah, and we need you guys to be advocates, right? We need to get more involved in all these things so that we're, this is, the, these are, you guys are the early adopters, you're at Tech Show. So we need your voices and you need to be involved in your local bar associations and having these discussions, like these decisions that are coming out right now about like proving to the court whether you used AI. I'm like, oh my gosh, please, can we please speak up and stop this insanity? Um, your KPIs are gonna change. One of my KPIs for my team, we don't bill by the hour, but every Monday we look at how many overdue tasks as a team do we have? And if there's 40, we have a problem and we go solve it. So it's just, it's a matter of rethinking things. I've got several family law attorneys who don't do a subscription, but everything's flat fee. It's just like a menu. So if it's a deposition, you know, you and as a client, you can now go and look at this pricing in her menu and say, oh, okay, so we're going to have two depositions and this is how much it is or whatever. And so there's there's different ways to solve the litigation problem because I know everyone's always like, I could never tell you at the start of a case how much it's going to cost because we don't know which people are gonna get deposed and all the things. And I'm like, guys, this building that you're sitting in right now was done on a flat fee contract. Every skyscraper around us was done on a flat fee contract. Were there change orders? You betcha. But also those are opportunities for you to have really valuable conversations with your clients, right? Like I'm not suggesting that you pick a price and say, I'm gonna do your divorce for $20,000 and forever more because you're gonna be fighting over a toaster for the next 10 years but there's different ways of, of setting out your pricing and then having conversations with your clients when circumstances change. So again, remember where I said, we gotta get comfortable talking about money. All right, we got lots of questions. Matt so, already went. So, so we'll go over here more. and then so, we'll come back to you. Okay. okay, okay, we'll come back to you. Yeah, so it sounds like there's limited work at the beginning and then you're kind of done within 30 days. So that, that may not be a subscri that may not be how you do a subscription. It may be a flat fee. If you wanted to build in a subscription, there could be other value that you offer to the client beyond what that document you just described. So like Matt's talking about, it's like, Matt, it's like access. When you sign up to be part of my community, you get more than just your coaching calls, right? You get access to content. You get access to monthly webinars. You get quarterly strategy sessions. Now you get access to my new tool, Lasso the Lab Coach, which is a trained on all of our content. So 24 seven, you could go ask a question to our AI bot. And it's really weird because it kind of sounds like me as to what I would answer. So people might pay for access to your templates. One lawyer I know created a community similar to us and people pay for access to other business owners. Like she actually has her clientele are female business owners. So when you are part of her program she has monthly meetups for business owners that she hosts and then she has like here's your latest news of what's happening in legal that might impact your business but people pay for things beyond like we're so limited sometimes we just are used to thinking that people are paying us to write documents and and they're paying for so much we're we're worth more and, and one of the greatest values that we can provide to clients, in my opinion, is issue spotting, right? How do, how do clients know they have a problem right now, potential clients? It's because lawyers advertise an issue spot for them in the advertisements. Do you have mesothelioma? I mean, like, I, I don't know, like, like those sort of billboard ads, those kind of things, you know, were you in a car accident? Like, you, you, know, you might have a legal claim. Like, we, the lawyers, have to tell them, we have to issue spot for them. So, so if somebody hires you, if you're a handy man, handy person to come over and hammer a nail and you just come, you, you, they pay you, the hammer the nail, you're done. No, you're going to go there and you're going to look around. What else here, my skill set that I can help fix that I see is broken here or that might become a problem in the future that I have the skills to handle. So you don't just come in and be like, boom, hammer, nail, go. Think, you know, when you issue spot for this client, even if it's not the reason that they hired you and you're trying to help them, right? Yes. Like you're trying to actually help them. You're not just looking for ways to earn revenue. You're trying to think about what are ways that I can help this person? What's values that I could provide? And that's maybe another flat fee or a subscription. You do a subscription so they get the discount on the 30 day thing. I have a client who was doing regulatory, like when people got in trouble with regulatory issues and they would get them out of trouble. Well, he realized I actually now have a skill set for how to keep people out of trouble in the first place. 
So they started creating checklists and processes. So now when you're in their program and you're part of their subscription, you get access to all the checklists and templates and all the things you need to run your business to stay out of trouble, which is great. Like that's what we want as, as lawyers. We, want, we don't want our clients getting in trouble. So he realized like my problem solving litigation mindset actually gives me the skills but I, he had to just repackage it completely different. And so now he's selling like, here's my compliance checklists. All right, we had more questions. We'll try to get to all of them. We're just gonna do this. Mad God. Yeah, Jane's really excited right now. She wants, <laughs> like this is a huge problem for our industry, right? A lot of people don't know we have le that they even have legal problems. We've always said like, I mean, honestly, if you wanna also advocate for this, I feel like we need a, got milk campaign for lawyers right like there's a lot of industries that have done a lot of good work just educating people that they have problems and we're kind of we could do better but you asked a lot there. yeah yeah so so we're not going to be able to repeat that question <laughs> so the uh, i there is definitely an education gap um when i started two years ago i was thinking even before i got started longer than two years ago i was thinking like like this is a no-brainer right like i design like i I kind of want to ask this question. How many of you can afford your own legal fee? I mean. Kind of over there. I saw kind of, and maybe one more in the back, I right? I often tell my husband, like, we're never, we better fix this fight because we can't afford a divorce right now. Like, it's expensive. <laughs> so I could afford my own legal fees. I designed my practice so that I could. Someone with, well, I don't have six figures of student loan debt anymore, but I did. I still have some student loans. And so, I could afford my own legal fees. And so that I feel like if we as lawyers can't even afford our own legal fees, what are we doing? Right? So I so my point is that for that is I thought that everyone else who might have like want to just be able to offload their legal stuff on a lawyer, now they can affordably do that with me. But that market has gone so long without actually hiring lawyers that they're not thinking that. And it's actually of, like I don't, I have more latent legal market clients, but I do have institutional clients because I do have to. They, they're like basically subsidizing my latent legal market practice, and and they love it even more because they're not. They don't have to worry about time and tracking time and how much is this going to cost. Because um, I charge them a much higher monthly subscription to just take care of all their business needs, right? Their legal business needs. Yeah, there's so much opportunity. Most law firms are going after the same clients. So if you start rethinking your value and rethinking who you serve and how you help them, it opens up so many opportunities. I mean, like with us, we're like, look, we want to work with the law firms that want to stay healthy. And so are there clients out there who would pay to stay healthy? Like, like just like a concierge doctor. Again, like these are service, but, and then you can start building your model and thinking about your services differently because there's, there's help needed for sure. People but, need it. Yeah, but, but Stephanie, the got milk thing, it's a great idea because there's a huge education gap, massive education gap, right? Like this is part of the reason why I have my podcast. Yeah, you know, it's got a couple of sponsors, whatever. It like doesn't make any money really. And so the whole point is like to get more lawyers to do it and also raise awareness that it's even an option. And I, I try to get like just even potential clients to listen to it. So they could like, the next time they hire a lawyer, they could demand from their lawyer, I want predictable pricing. I know it's an option. I heard so-and-so on the Law Subscribe podcast talk about how they're doing it for their clients. Why can't you do it for me? So like my podcast is the solution to that because that's all it focuses on, right? So, but, but the, like we need to do more and the more lawyers using the subscription model the, or, or alternative or pricing, or, yeah. the, the more, you know, rising tide lifts all boats kind of a mentality. So when I kind of got started, when I sold my practice and I got started in this space calling myself a coach, I had the opportunity to lead Georgia's incubator. So a lot of states started these. The law school deans all got together and realized they're graduating lawyers, they're hanging a shingle, and they don't know what they're doing. So we created these incubators to help them. And part of the idea was that we could teach these lawyers how to create socially conscious law firms to solve this problem. So it's kind of near and dear to my heart. And... But here was the key. What we learned is you can't just charge less. Like we hear this term low bono a lot. You can't just charge less and s offer the same services. As a business, it just didn't work. So we had lawyers who were trying to offer and compete with what the high dollar lawyers were doing, but just charge less to serve this underserved market. And as a business, it that's just not really easy to do unless you have like volume, like just it just wasn't going to work. So my 
suggestion is like I think there's such the untapped market and there's so many opportunities and I would love to see you know that be one of your takeaways is here is and offering like not everybody if you're selling the Porsche right now or even the Hyundai you know not everyone can afford that so do you have an option that somebody could afford so you don't have to reimagine your whole law firm you could just start offering a lower level service but you've got to think about the whole model has to work. So you have to think about what are you scoping and how are you pricing that? Can you leverage AI? Like now that I have this AI tool that's built out on the content that we've spent years writing, I, pro- I mean, it doesn't cost me very much money. I probably could sell access to that tool pretty reasonably. I mean, I haven't figured out how to, I haven't thought about it yet. So I'm not going to say a price, but that doesn't mean I'm still not going to charge and do my one, one-on-one personalized coaching services. But if somebody's just coming and launching their law firm and they're like, wow, I, I, I'm not ready for one-on-one services yet, Stephanie. I'm like, no problem. I have a place for you. Start here. Yeah, I, an example I like to give is lawyers who charge the billable hour are Neiman Marcus, right? How often are you going to shop at Neiman Marcus? That, that's the only option though. So you can only buy a Porsche. If you need legal services, you got to buy a Porsche. Y'all, I'm Target, Walmart even, you know, uh, I'm never, I, I just want to stay a true solo and leverage these AI tools. And I think I could live a comfortable life. I'm not going to be a multimillionaire attorney, but that's okay with me. You can take this approach and do that. Like look at Walmart. I think they're doing all right. So there's huge market opportunity there to go back to the question, right? But there's this education gap and that's, and that's a big problem. Yeah. Question. So, okay. Great question. Phenomenal question. So the question was that there's fewer options at Neiman Marcus and there's tons of options at Target. And so from a legal perspective of being able to offer more, how do you do that? And what are the ethical quandaries? So when people pay you and it's a sunk cost every month, then they're going to call you and you should also reach out to them and be like, Hey, is there anything I can help you with? Here's the link to schedule a 15 minute call because you want to keep them subscribed and you want to be providing them value, even though arguably they're getting the value of having the access, right? At tw- and what is a fee reasonable at $20 a month? Well, when people are incentivized to call you, before there's a problem or the problem has just started, you could usually avoid that problem entirely or cut it off before it becomes an issue. And to become competent in a particular thing to before it's actually a giant legal problem is very possible. I like to say my practice is a mile wide and inches deep. If it goes more than a few inches deep, guess what? I need to refer you to an attorney that they do inches wide, miles deep. And that's what I do. And so having really good relationships with other attorneys, you know, whether you're involved in the bar associations or you're using some of these new referral, referral platforms, one of them was in Startup Valley, though they're just focusing on PI, but I could tell you that they're not marketing it, but I can tell you for a fact, I'm on there for business and random landlord tenant stuff too. So they just, they haven't built out those features yet. So looking for these platforms. And I, I think, I think the future of legal services is going to be independent attorneys leveraging AI and automations to deliver very specific legal services and a network of them. So you'll be able to, and, and, you know, there could be like a, like legal shield is legal insurance, right? It's not actually a law firm and getting legal services. It's discounted billable hour rates when you need a problem. But I think there's a version of that for an actual law firm or, or an idea that you can subscribe to. And when you need the, the PI attorney, when you need the, the document thing. So, so like that's the future that I see, but it's in, it's like a network of independent attorneys. And I think that that's how you handle that kind of thing. But there is always room for the general pre- practitioner that can help cut off the problem. And so we're getting close on time. Go ahead, Stephanie. My advice is start small. Experiment. You don't have to change your whole practice. If you, you, you have an established practice right now, and if some of this is resonating with you and you're like, wow, I kind of want to try that, experiment. What could that look like? You don't have to, again, you're no, you don't have to say no to all your current clients and say, I'm only doing this but just get started and come up with one offering. So, you know, now you're gonna expand that offering and then do that, test it for a while. Once it's going, now maybe I can expand and do another offering. And you just kind of go and keep iterating, get 1% better each week or each month. And I promise you, you'll be a ton better. We've got one more question. We have tons of resources. I did bring a little freebie. I have one copy of my book left if somebody wants to come at the the end and claim it. If not, give me your business card. I'll mail you a copy. And on our podcast, I mean, we both talk about this a lot on our podcast, but I have this little card here. We just happen to have 
of episodes we've done on this issue with Ron Baker and with, you know, experts talking about and some real live lawyers who are doing this. Because I think it sometimes helps to hear like Rebecca, how she's doing flat fee divorce work, how Brandon's doing, what's Brandon doing? He's doing litigation subscription services for business clients. Yeah, Brandon, can I talk about Brandon for a second? So I heard Brandon on the Lawyer's Podcast. I immediately invited him onto my podcast. And you know what's absolutely incredible about what he did to figure out his subscription pricing for litigation, civil litigation, is he asked his client, what's your budget for this, for the next year? What's your budget for a year? Okay, let's divide that by 12. Who would have thought we could ask our clients? And if you have a good relationship with your client, which he did, this was a, a pre-existing client, then they're gonna, you're gonna have an honest conversation about that dollar amount. Yeah, so, we had one more question, Okay. maybe. Oh, uh, you gotta pivot. You can't have two businesses in one model. Listen to my episode 33 with Robbie Kelman Baxter. She was the, like the first consultant at Netflix. She's a, a renowned subscription expert, and she talks about why you can't do that. So I mean, we've run out of time. All the technology though is in the deck. Every single piece of technology you'll, you'll need to use. Some of these are on the show floor. Uh, so go check them out. And some of these are all in one solutions, uh, but I use a number of solutions because I haven't quite found the all in one. So here's Stephanie's contact information. So yeah, feel free to reach out to Stephanie. Definitely subscribe to the Lawyers Podcast. I've been a listener for like a decade. Has it been going on that long? I feel like almost. And, and then here's my contact information if you, you need anything. Thank you so much for Thanks coming. Thanks for everybody. hanging out with these guys. That was fun.